Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T, and I hope you guys are all having a wonderful day. Before I launch into the main topic of this video, I want to touch briefly on the self-harm and or accident scenario that the Habersham County investigators are allegedly now considering in the Debbie Collier case. I was listening to Bill Cannon of Police Off the Cuff last night, and I find Bill Cannon a very good source for getting the perspective from a police officer. Cannon usually does his homework, and he knows the details when he speaks about the various cases. Cannon is not buying into the self-harm scenario in the Debbie Collier case. Cannon posed several questions that really struck me. One, who drives so far out of town to a wooded area to do themselves in, especially a woman of Debbie's age? Why would Debbie Collier get out of her car and walk into the woods to harm herself when she could have just as easily pulled that move off inside her vehicle. Cannon also said that the investigators, instead of moving away from Debbie's daughter, Amanda Bearden, should be pressing on her hard at this point. She is, after all, the one who received the large Venmo payment with the cryptic message. So why are they allegedly backing off of Amanda and her boyfriend, Andrew Geigerich? It doesn't make sense unless the police have evidence that makes it clear that these two aren't involved or the investigators are hitting a wall and they want the easy way out. One more thing I wanted to add. I noticed that Andrew Geigerich's mother, Vicki Lynn Terrell, who's currently in prison serving a 30-year sentence for selling meth, she shares the same last name as the sheriff of Habersham County, Joey Terrell. Is it possible these two people are related? Maybe that's a name as common as Smith in Georgia and Alabama. But I thought it was rather ironic that they have the same last name. And we know that Sheriff Terrell has been, according to Jeffrey Bearden, laughing at him when he asked for information on his mother's case. Debbie Collier's son, Jeffrey, also wrote that post yesterday. And here's an excerpt from it. He wrote, and I quote, I absolutely believe my mother's death was done intentionally by someone else, and my mother would absolutely never go into the woods alone. I have a hard time even believing that's my mother on the family dollar store video. End quote. Jeffrey seems to be in the same place that most of us are, and that is we don't know what evidence the investigators have. But it's very hard to believe that a woman would drive all that way away from home just to do herself in, and that she would opt to pour accelerant on her clothes and then put a flame to herself. There are much less painful ways and much quicker ways to get the job done. On to the main topic of this video, the clues in Steve Collier's 911 call to the police to let them know that his wife, Debbie, seems to be missing. Since the detectives appear to be hitting a wall, I thought I'd do what good detectives do when they hit a wall, and that is go back to the beginning and revisit the evidence. Fancying myself a pseudo-sleuth and still dealing with confusion over this so-called change in direction in the Debbie Collier case, I decided to listen once again to the 911 call that Debbie's husband, Steve Collier, made from his and Debbie's home in Athens, Georgia, on the evening of Saturday, September 10th, 2022. And I wanted to analyze it because that call marks the moment Debbie Collier's name becomes known to the police as a possible missing person. Note that Debbie's daughter, 36-year-old Amanda Bearden, 
was with Steve Collier when he called the police. In my head, I picture the two of them in the kitchen, with Steve dialing and Amanda either standing or sitting, looking at him as he speaks to the dispatch operator. What strikes me as odd from the get-go about this 911 call on Saturday evening is that Steve Collier is the one who dials 911. Why isn't Amanda the one making the phone call? We know that Amanda isn't afraid to call the police or dial 911. That's obvious from her criminal history. She dialed 911 many times, and it sounds like the cops in Athens know her by name because they've dealt with her many times in the past. So we can't say that Amanda was too timid to dial 911 for herself. Also, Amanda is the one with all the critical information. We know this because Steve tells the operator that he just got home from work and he thought his wife was grocery shopping because that's what she always does on Saturday. From what Steve says, it doesn't sound like Debbie being missing or possibly having some problem were even on his radar until Amanda showed up and told him about her mother's cryptic message and about her mom's purse and driver's license still being upstairs in the Collier home despite Debbie not being there, her phone not being there, her rental van not being there. So Amanda is driving all this concern and urgency at this point, and she's the one with all the information related to a possible situation where her mother is being held by people who plan on doing her harm and on not letting her go. Amanda is the one feeding the details to Steve. Also, Steve clearly has trouble hearing the 911 operator. It sounds like he has a hearing problem. So wouldn't it have been more efficient to have Amanda talk to the operator? And if she was so worried, you'd think she'd want to get all the information conveyed to the police as quickly as possible so that they could maybe go out and start looking for Debbie. Note that Steve tells the operator that Debbie is 59 years old and she doesn't have Alzheimer's or any other medical issues. So he didn't say anything about Debbie Collier being depressed or having any mental health issues. And Amanda doesn't chime in either to say that her mother has any issues with depression. So neither Steve nor Amanda are saying that they saw any signs of depression in Debbie. Of course, depressed people are good at hiding this sometimes, but it's still worth mentioning that Debbie's closest relatives told the police that she was fine and she had no mental health or physical issues. Note that Amanda will state this on Sunday as well when she shows up the crime scene and the police ask her about her mother's mental health. Once again, Amanda says no. Her mother doesn't have depression, and she hasn't expressed a desire to harm herself. Next, Steve tells the operator about the cryptic message that Debbie Collier sent to her daughter, Amanda. But Steve only mentions the words, they're not going to let me go. And when the operator asks him if that's all the message said, he replies yes. Why doesn't Steve tell the operator the full message, which was, they're not going to let me go, love you, the key to the house is under the blue flower pot. I have to assume that Steve doesn't share the full message because Amanda Bearden didn't tell him the full message. And note that she doesn't chime in to say in the background, wait, there was more to the message. Why not? Steve also clearly doesn't know that Amanda received nearly $2,400 with the cryptic message because he doesn't mention it to the 911 operator. Why didn't Amanda tell Steve about the money? You'd think that would be a critical detail to share with both Steve and the 911 dispatch operator, right? Amanda remains completely mum about that. Why? And then there's the element of time when the 911 operator asks when the cryptic message was sent to Amanda. Steve appears to ask Amanda, and she confirms that it was about two hours earlier. 
Now, Steve Collier dialed 911 around 6.01 p.m. Two hours earlier would have been 4 p.m., but Debbie Collier sent the note at 3.17 p.m., so that would have been two hours and 43 minutes earlier. That's nearly three hours earlier. The operator wasn't asking Amanda when she noticed her mother's cryptic note. He asked when the note was sent. Amanda should have told Steve two hours and 43 minutes ago, or she could have rounded it up to three hours ago. You'd think that if Amanda was worried about her mother, that she'd want to get the time right. Three hours might have made the red flag she wanted to raise seem all the more serious. Amanda's boyfriend, Andrew Geigerich, has said Amanda didn't notice that her mother sent her the message and all that money until 4.17 p.m. Well, he actually said about an hour after Debbie sent it. But that, again, is not what the dispatch operator was asking about. Why didn't Amanda say the precise time when she's supposedly so concerned that her mother's being held by abductors who aren't going to let her go? Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories, do me a favor, hit that like button, subscribe, leave me a comment. Yes, uh, came on, my wife wasn't home, her driver's license still in there, the rental car is gone, and her daughter's here, and we were kind of worried about what's happening and where she's at. I was wondering if you could send somebody over here. Okay, if you have any medical issue, let's say like Alzheimer's or something like that? Uh, no, no, she's uh, 59 years old. No, she has no medical issues or something like that. And according to her daughter, who went up and uh, her purse is still here with her driver's license. The only thing is the phone is gone, and she sent her daughter a text about two hours ago saying, they won't let me go. Whatever that means, we don't know. And I've been gone all day parking cars for the football game, and, all, and what, that's what, where we're at. What's your address, sir? 435 Rocky Drive, Athens, Georgia. You said 435 Rocky Drive? Yes, it's right next to Sandy Creek Park. <clears throat> okay, so she sent your daughter a text message saying that they my stepdaughter stepdaughter that they won't let her go. Yeah, they got she got a text message saying that, and it come from her number, right? What what is um what's your name, sir? Steve Collier. Say your last name for me. C O L L I E R. And your wife's name? Deb, Deborah, Debora, uh, we call it Debbie, but it's D E B O R R A H. The same last name? Collier, yes. How old is she? Is that 59? 59. She just turned 59. You just Thank returned you. home, right? Pardon me? You just returned home, right? Yes, I just returned home. I was parking cars uh, until about 4.30, and when I came back to her, the van that she had rented because the car was in the shop uh, was gone. I figured she was shopping for food. Okay. So, you, so and her car is there? Pardon me? Her, her, her van is not here. Okay. But her driver's license and what else is there? Right. Her phone? Yeah, her driver's license is here. What else did she leave? For the purse or anything else? Uh, yeah, she left her purse, and her credit cards are here. When, when was the last time um, she was seen? Uh, well, I left at 9 o'clock, and she was still sleeping. So, uh, last night. I mean, so, she was went to bed last night, and your step I left, and the van was here. So, is your stepdaughter there, though? I mean, did she, did she see her today? Pardon me? Did your stepdaughter see her today? Part women. You say a stepdaughter. Did she see her or? Say that again. I'm trying to control a dog. Okay, your your stepdaughter. Did she see her? Um, no, recently? no. Nobody has seen her. Uh, I was probably the last person to see her last night. What time? You said nine o'clock last night. Yeah, about nine o'clock we went to bed. You left this morning, right? Yes, at about nine. 
I'm sorry. So did you see her this morning or last night? No, I saw her last night at about 9 when she went to bed. And when I left, the van was here. And so she, she was, you don't know if she was still there or not. You didn't see her this morning. Right, except the van was still here. So I'm assuming she was sleeping. What time was the message sent to your stepdaughter? Uh, what, what time? About two hours ago? <clears throat> so about two hours ago? Yes. And it specifically said they won't let me go. Pardon? Yeah, that's what the message said. And is that that's all it said, right? That's all it said. And she was last seen driving, or she was driving her, what kind of car is that? It's, uh, I don't know, because her car's in the shop, so, uh, uh, the rental place on, uh... The van that she was driving, is that what she'd be in, or you don't know? No, I don't know. It's, uh, Enterprise. She went in a car for Enterprise. It's a Pacifica or something. That's the car you saw this morning, though, right? Yeah, the black van, yeah. It's a black Pacifica? Yes, I'm pretty sure it's Pacifica. And that's a rental car? Yes, from Enterprise. All right, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> what's her, uh, what's her birthday? Deborah. D E D B I E, or oh, her, her given her, name is Deborah. No, no, her birthday. D B O R R A H. Her birthday? And she white, female, black, female? Pardon me? She white or black? White. How tall is she? Uh, about 5'5. Five, five. How much do you weigh? About 150. 145, somewhere around there. What color hair? Uh, blondish. Would she be going to somebody's house, or? That's a good question. I thought she was out shopping for food. Her daughter came over with that strange message and then went upstairs to her bedroom and found out that uh, uh, her driver's license and credit card still here. So that doesn't sound like her leaving the house uh, to go shopping like I thought she was. She usually shopped for food on Saturday. So she don't have any money at all with her or any other car? Or Not to our knowledge. She has nothing. But she is a purse there? Yes. She left a purse as well? Yes. Does she have family here in town? No, just her daughter. Have you tried to call the hospitals and jails just to be, be sure? Uh, no, I didn't think of calling the hospital. Okay. Go ahead. Like I said, I got them on the way out there to you. Okay. Go ahead, okay. Go ahead, go ahead and call both hospitals at the okay. regional and St. Mary's and, and just check with okay. the jail as well to make sure. Um, and we'll have somebody come out there and talk to you. Okay. Um, I appreciate it. And your phone number? Yes. Okay. Okay. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye.